Wireless Land Weekly, episode 35, Wireless Value Added Resellers and Troubleshooting Tips. Welcome to Wireless Land Weekly, a podcast focused on the wireless networking professional. We aim to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire. Get ready to listen and enjoy. Now to our host of the show, Keith Parsons. Hello again, this is Keith Parsons with Wireless Land Weekly. This is episode 35, and today we have uh, two different types of sessions. In the first one, we have Jared Griffith. He's a wireless value-added reseller, and we'll talk a little bit about his life and how he uh, works in the wireless industry. And the second one is Tim Dennehy, who is a wireless consultant, network engineer at University of Kansas, and they had a kind of unique scenario, and he's written up a kind of in a story form uh, how their troubleshooting process went through and uh, the end result of how they got it to work in the end. And both of these uh, are pretty good stories that let you have a little insight into the lives of wireless land professionals. So now let's get on with the show. Interesting facts, little known tidbits, things you might not have known, short little bits to set your mind a reeling. You might want to write down the MAC addresses of all of the NICs in your laptop. If your laptop ever goes missing, someone stole it, especially in a campus or a large office or school environment, you can always go and search the cam tables on the switch fabric and see if that MAC address shows up anywhere, track down the port, and you can help track down where your device was plugged in. So, to hint for the day, keep those MAC addresses saved someplace other than in the same laptop, and they might come back to help you one day. It's a very easy little trick to try. Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Gear up, buckle down, and stand by for the real techie stuff. Hello, this is Keith Parsons with Wireless LAN Weekly. And in today's episode, I have with me Jared Griffith, the CEO and president of Synergy Wi-Fi. They've been along uh, around just about a year now as a value-added reseller in the Wi-Fi space. And so, uh, welcome, Jared. Hey, thanks for having us, Keith. Glad to be on. I thought it'd be interesting for our audience to get a perspective of uh, what a value-added reseller does and the kind of things you can bring to the table and uh, kind of what your life is. Even you're a wireless LAN professional. This is the Wireless LAN Professionals uh, podcast, so thought that would meet together. So first of all, what is a value-added reseller and what kind of things do you add in a, in a wireless install? Well, my, my definition of a value-added reseller is, is when a manufacturer sells a line of equipment, but they don't have a direct sales force um, to support that in the field. And so being a value-added reseller for Ruckus Wireless, um, we are the first, first line of approach um, from an end user, and uh, we offer many um, value adds to our customers. Uh, we do free surveys, free installation, uh, the only thing that we charge for is the equipment and uh, the wiring if we have to do it. And uh, it's the uh, it's the post site survey and also the work that we do for them if there's any problems or issues. Uh, going back out on site, they don't have to contact the manufacturer, they contact us directly. And we're able to take our, our tools and our skill set out there and uh, diagnose the problem and uh, resolve it. Okay, so you've been uh, a pretty small shop, I gather, since you just started about a year ago. Of the things that a reseller might do, sales, the technical, and the actual install, which of those do you do and which do you like to do and which you'd like to do more or less of? Well, um, right now, I do all three. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's one of those positions when you're as new and as small as we are, um, you have to do everything or you starve to death. Um, my my least favorite is the sales. Um, I, I've done that most of my career, and uh, I actually enjoy the the installation and the troubleshooting part of it more than I do the sales process. Um, and I, I'd like to see myself stepping out of the sales mode and uh, become more of a, a professional and just be able to work on 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 the actual equipment, uh, the installation and the surveying and, and all the post uh, side problems and issues that arise from it. Okay, and so uh, when you go on site, it's a, I'm, I'm assuming this is, it takes multiple cycles. The sales cycle, one survey, another install, and then a post survey install. 
how many different trips do you actually have to take to on, on site in order to accomplish your entire project? Well, on, on initial and new customers, it, it takes about uh, four trips before we're completed and uh, out of there. Um, on existing customers um, who we've got a great relationship with and keep purchasing equipment from us, um, it's usually uh, one, one or two trips. But definitely the, the sales cycle um, is somewhat draining on a new customer because uh, we have to go out for the initial meeting, set up a time to do a, a site survey, and then come back to them with our our findings and our quote. And then once they uh, pull the trigger, it's a installation time and post site survey. So it's a, it can be up to five trips sometimes if there's uh, no problems or no issues. And what kind of range uh, uh, you're, I'm, I'm also in Utah and I happen to know you're in Utah, uh, what, about an hour and a half away, so away from where I am. What kind of range does your company cover? So far, um, we, we've not turned down work uh, anywhere. Um, we've done two hospitals in Nebraska. Um, we've done schools in Colorado, schools in Utah. Um, we've been to Texas, Florida. We, we definitely don't turn away work. Uh, we're, we're willing, if, uh, if the customer is willing to spend money, we'll get on the plane and, and we'll go out there and we'll meet with them and do what needs to be done. But uh, I'd, I'd like to see it um, either get some more people in those areas where our business is picking up so that we don't have to travel as much, but we'll go anywhere and uh, we'll do just about anything to uh, keep our business afloat and keep our customers very happy. Well, happy customers is, is the end result we're all looking for. What did you do personally to prepare for a, a, a job in wireless value added reselling? Well, I worked for a wireless manufacturer for about 18 months um, before this. and. Um, I was in a region that didn't have any uh, local support people directly. So I, I played all those parts and it, it taught me to be very self-sufficient. Everything from finding the customer, making the sales presentations, doing the surveys, the installations. And uh, it, you know, I, I thank them very much for um, teaching me all those things and, and making me a little bit better in the technical aspect than a lot of the other salespeople uh, that I worked with. So that really prepared me to be able to step out on my own, get relationships with manufacturers, and uh, be able to design, deploy, and help my. Hey, what did you uh, do education-wise? I mean, did you go to CWNA classes, uh, CWTS classes, or just uh, studying on your own? From the, I'm thinking more along the 802 or 11 lines. Yeah, um, to, to be quite honest with you, um, I, I have no official training. Uh, that's something I'm, I'm working on very hard right now to get certifications um, from the CWNA. And um, <clears throat> the biggest thing that I've tried to do is surround myself with, uh, with very smart people and learn from them and learn from my own mistakes and always try to understand what I'm doing before I do it to make sure I'm doing the correct thing. But definitely, um, I, I am a little weak in the certification area. Um, but that's something that, that we're trying to change as rapidly as we can. Well, how do you uh, stay current on moving technologies? I mean, what are you like in the social media space, or you just do it by what, reading magazines? What's your uh, option of choice of staying current? Um, definitely social media. Um, what what I like is uh, I like to stay away from the manufacturers um, blogs and what they're putting out because it's all um, personal based around what they're doing. What I'm trying to learn is I'm trying to learn the actual specs and um, what other people that are in the field just like me are saying and doing ab about the items on the market and you know future technology. Uh, social media is by far the best tool that I have right now to see what's coming down the road, to understand it, and to get other people's opinions and takes of why it will work, why it won't work, and what what are the uh, pitfalls of it if if you do that. Blogs and uh, and Twitter especially are are probably some of the best things that are out there on the market right now. Uh, what's your Twitter handle? How can people follow you on Twitter? Uh, our our Twitter handle is Synergy Wi-Fi. And that's uh, synergy with a C, not a not a S. Correct. Yeah, we uh, we spelled a little bit differently. It's uh, C I N E R G Y, and then just Wi-Fi on the end. All right, and we'll make sure we hit that in the show notes as well. Well, what kind of things keep you up at night in your wireless uh, job? 
Definitely, it's uh, it's two things that that take the uh, top of the list, and that's uh, making sure all the bills are paid, and then making sure our customers are happy, uh, making sure that uh, we answered all those phone calls and and fixed uh, any and all problems that were out there. It's uh, th- those are the two things that that get my most attention and keep me up at night. Well, I'm sure you have uh, lots of tools you play with in your job, from site surveying tool, actually. I- I'm kind of cheating here. I've seen his a trailer that he takes around, so I know what kind of things he has in his, in his, in his trailer. Uh, but tell us, what are your, the favorite tools you use to help you do your job a little better? Um, well, to be honest with you, Keith, uh, Site Survey Pro is um, probably my most favorite tool right now. Um, we've uh, recently spent a lot of capital and increased our, our tool set. Um, we've purchased uh, Air Magnet Spectrum XT, and we've got a uh, Wi-Fi analyzer on the way and also Fluke Air Check. And uh, I'm quite excited to get the Air Check. Uh, I think it'll, uh, all these tools that we recently purchased will definitely help um, decrease our, our time on site and increase our bottom line. Well, and that's what the tools were for. So you talked about how you stay current on, on Twitter and how you prepared and how you do your little studying. And you said you'd, you're working on uh, getting a CWNA, what's the, other than just having the certificate to hang on your wall, why would you want to go through the trouble and the hassle of, uh, you know, passing that test? Well, to, to be quite honest with you, it's, uh, I, I'm going to call it the brotherhood. It's the community of professionals out there that have that certificate that um, I, I feel like once you achieve that knowledge, that you can belong to that group and not only will it help me grow as an individual and be able to learn everything about the 802.11 uh, spec but also it's uh, the, the fact that the people that you meet um, you define yourself as, as a certain individual um, and I always had a teacher in, in high school that said as soon as you stop learning you stop living and uh, I truly believe that and uh, I think taking the time to pass the certification to learn it, it only makes me better as a wireless LAN professional. Okay, well, just uh, two final questions. Uh, when you were starting your business, you could, you could have picked just about any company. Why did you go with uh, Ruckus as the as your brand of choice? Well, I, I see a lot of good things in Ruckus. Um, number one, their their product set is a little bit different than than a lot of other people's when it comes to in, antenna design. And uh, that caught me uh, right away. I, I wanted to learn more about it. Um, they didn't look cookie cutter like a lot of other people. The next thing was I, I purchased some of their equipment and uh, I put it out at, at a customer site and uh, I wanted them to try it for two weeks with uh, their you know carts of computers. It was an education customer. And they came back after two weeks and told me that it was it was probably the best um, technology equipment that they've ever used in the wireless space. And this this is a customer that has uh, four other wireless vendors in their school district. And uh, it was definitely the easiest to install and uh, program. And uh, to this point, we have we've only had uh, one access point be DOA out of the box. We've been very fortunate. I think they're a top-notch manufacturer, and uh, they definitely stand behind their partners also. Well, that's good. And the final question for you here, uh, by the way, thanks for sharing uh, your decision on why you went with Ruckus. If someone else was thinking about, uh, you know, perhaps leaving their, their current cushy employment where they get paid every week and, and to enter into the, the world of a value-added reseller, what advice would you give them? Well, my, my biggest advice um, to them would, would be two things. It would, and number one, it would don't give up on yourself. Um, in the beginning, it's, it's, it's always tough. And uh, you get a lot more no's than you get yeses because you're not established. And um, it, it can be tough at times, but you just have to persevere and uh, push through the no's and you'll find plenty of yeses. And uh, the second thing would be is don't make the same mistakes that I, I've made. And and that's buying tools twice. Um, you think because you're starting out, you're on a limited budget that, that you should uh, buy less expensive tools. And uh, in, in my instance, I bought um, VisiWave uh, for a survey tool um, because it was a quarter of the price of Air Magnet Survey Pro. And uh, then, then I bought um, 
Wi-Spy, and they're both great products, um, but you definitely um, can see the difference when when you upgrade your tool set. And so my my big advice would be don't buy your tools twice. Buy the one you want first, and uh, and you'll be much happier. All right. Well, thanks for your time today, Jared. And is there uh, any way that people can get in contact with you if they wanted to ask further questions or uh, check out your website? Definitely. Uh, you can go to, um, we have two sites. Uh, we have uh, www.synergywifi.com, which is our corporate site. And then we also have www.ruckusgear.com, uh, which is our store. And uh, our toll-free number is 877-RUCKUS-WIFI and uh, you can reach us there. Well, thanks for your time, and I hope you have uh, great success in your value-added reselling. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Keith. It was a pleasure to be on your show. Things every wireless LAN professional needs to know. Being a professional means more than just knowing the technical. Listen up to these items to help you on the professional side. Enjoy. Hello again, this is Keith Parsons, and today we've got with us a uh, wireless network engineer from University of Kansas by the name of Tim Dennehy. And Tim's got a, a story to tell us about an experience with Cisco, APs, Macintoshes, PCs, uh, and luckily it has a very nice conclusion. And we brought him on board today for this podcast uh, as an example of some things you might find in your own wireless networks and how he went around in the process he did to come up with a, a appropriate conclusion. So, Tim, glad we could have you on the show today. Thanks. So, you want to just jump right into your story? Sure. Okay, last year, uh, school ended and everybody left. And we had all of our, our, our controllers, all 16 of them, running 5.2. And we upped them to 6 over the summer and then to version 7. So, we could run the new the Cisco 3502s. We do this over the summers simply because we can get... Uh, larger uh, service windows. And fast forward a couple of months, we have uh, the Kansas football games starting to show up. And the press box is only used for maybe a dozen times a year. And everything was fine, we thought, until the press started to show up. We have uh, four wireless LANs broadcasting on the eighth floor of our press box. We have the main SSID for students and staff, ticket scanners, the uh, statistics machines, and the guest wireless. First football game, press arrives, and they couldn't get on the guest wireless. They tried to switch from one SSID to another. It turns out they were getting on the wrong SSID. They were getting on the student and staff, and when they tried to then switch over to the guest network, their Macintoshes would not get an IP address. The XP Vista Windows 7 machines seem to work flawlessly. So this network is pretty much unused all year round except for you know a dozen, maybe 15 games. So it's extremely difficult to troubleshoot when somebody shows up. Uh, we have literally minutes to, to get it all running. And then they do their thing, and then they leave, and we never get to see what the workstations are. We never get to troubleshoot anything. It's, it's sort of a like a conference event where everybody jumps in and then leaves. So we tried to get a wireless sniffer trace. We, we couldn't seem to get any DHCP requests. And, and uh, we started looking around started Googling and we found other people with the same type of Macintosh issue. Uh, not exactly the same one, but close enough. Turns out the Macintoshes didn't seem to want to jump between SSIDs as fast as maybe their other, uh, the Windows XP and everyone else. Next step, we uh, downloaded Wireshark onto our XP laptops, but it just didn't seem to catch the conversation of others because we don't have the promiscuous adapter. So we found uh, we found a, an Apple box. Uh, we put Wireshark on that machine. And sure enough, we ended up seeing the, the, the DHCP request leaving the Macintosh. So something was awry here. Uh, 
we called Cisco TAC and they called back within an hour and said, try enabling fast SSID change. He said this would, would help the clients change between SSIDs faster than normal. Uh, we turned it on and it immediately helped. We, we then backed out. Over the summer, we, we went from 5.2 to 6 to 7. And then we also changed some of our SSIDs around. And we thought that maybe the changing the SSID was the fault. So last week, we changed, we, we backed out all the changes and, and put the SSIDs back the way they were with the different web off mechanisms and the same exact pages, etc. And we still had the issue of changing between SSIDs. Since we can't really downgrade code in a fashion that we can't guarantee it will be working when we bring it back up, we didn't download, uh, we didn't downgrade. So what we ended up doing was putting everything back the way it was and just say that the only thing we can come up with is something in the, in the code upgrade made it more difficult for a Macintosh to change between SSIDs quickly. So where we are today is with our fast SSID enabled and running on version 7. And we can only think that it has something to do between 5.2 and 7.0. We have contacted Cisco and they said that the change, the, the fast SID change was not enabled in 5.2.178. And it's correct, it was not. And it was not enabled on 7.0. But something in there has changed. Either could be on the controller end, maybe it was an Apple update, maybe it was something somewhere. Uh, we just never seem to have the problem. And we don't know exactly when it started because these apples don't come to our network in such a fashion where they show up, need to get on, and then leave. They only do this you know, 15 times a year. And that's, that's the end of it. So it's working now. It's working beautifully. And uh, the net effect of all that trouble of download of downloading Wireshark, trying it on a Windows machine, running Air Magnet, finally getting Wireshark on a Mac machine, all came down to a simple about how many, how many characters do you think you had to type to actually make this happen? I couldn't even imagine. Fast SSID. Change. <laughs> and that was it. it. It was actually a checkbox. Oh, a single, a single checkbox solved the issue. Single checkbox. And it's not the amount of work in clicking the checkbox. It's knowing which checkbox to click. And, there, and there's no real documentation on it either. After we, we discovered, after we called TAC and they said, try this, we started Googling around and we sure as heck don't find anything out there that really says, this is why we did it. This is to fix this, that, and the other. We, we never really got that explanation other than, by golly, this thing works. Well, and now it does, and then we'll take your story and the solution, and we'll post it up on the show notes, and now there'll be one more pace, place when people Google, they'll be able to find there was a solution that uh, Tim found over at KU to have the Macintoshes do their little fast roaming a little better between SSIDs. I sure hope so. I hope it'll help somebody else out. Uh, what was the your troubleshooting steps you went through when it first didn't work. Um, I, in your story, you, you told a couple more things about how the, the techs who were working on it just said, you know, use this login credential. Well, what happens is, you know, we don't control the clients at all, and we don't get to preview the client. And then on the eighth floor of the press box, two hours before the game, people show up from everywhere. And then they try to get on the network, and they can't because, first of all, they get on the wrong SSID. I do believe that Macintosh, uh, they go to the signal strength. They, they, they try to choose the, the wireless line with the strongest signal strength. Since all four SSIDs are broadcasting from the same access point, then they go alphabetically. Well, so they try to hit J for Jayhawk, which is first in the alphabet with our SSIDs. And they get on the wrong one, so they and they're not paying attention. They've been given a temporary username password for the week, 
So they try it and they can't get on. They get frustrated and call someone for technical help. And that's when someone tells them, you're on the wrong SSID. You need to change SSIDs. So you, then they try to change SSIDs, and that's when the trouble begins. The Windows client seems to do it well. Uh, I checked an Ubuntu, uh, uh, an Ubuntu, and it seems to work fine. It's when the Macintosh tries to jump between SSIDs is when the, when the trouble starts. And when they, if they get on the right SSID, SSID to begin with, there's no issue at all. It's only when they get on the wrong one and they try to get on the right one. And then they get even more frustrated because now they're, they can't get an IP address. They seem to be locked up. And then they reboot their machine and they go back to the Jayhawk SSID and an employee ends up using his or her credentials to get them on the wireless network. And that's not exactly what we want. So if you, did you try any cycle of uh, turning off broadcast SSID on everything but the one you wanted them on? I've tried everything. I, I turned on Aeronet extensions. I turned them off. I, I turned SSID broadcasts on and off. I, I disabled some other wireless LANs trying to get them. And during our troubleshooting phase when people weren't there, it's an easy, easy network to work on uh, when there's no game because nobody's using it. And we tried dozens of things to replicate this. And we never actually could replicate it perfectly at, at all times. We could never come, with, come up with the smoking gun of exactly what, what fixes it uh, and what breaks it. But we do know that jumping between SSIDs is the cause of the problem. Amazing. What, 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 I, I feel for you. That's, that, this is not an easy... Uh, process to have to go through, especially when the press are there and there's a, just a little bit of pressure right before the game in order to make it work. Uh, it was, your recommendation for the future, if you're going to have to do this again and you had the same kind of problem, what would you do to mitigate it in the future? Well, first of all, I would start off with having the right tools in my tool belt. We were, we were completely caught off guard by this one. Uh, the debugs on the controllers didn't show anything. Uh, they didn't show the DHCP request coming in like we, like we expected. Um, it was extremely difficult to, to troubleshoot on a Windows box unless you have a, a sniffer. Um, you can't prove anything without having the clients there that are going to be there. And if you work in a hospital or something, why well, you can just go grab some of those machines. But the machines that were causing the problem were somewhere else, and we never get to preview them until they get here. So we'll tuck this away, and we'll know about it. I guess... Uh, having the right tool, and maybe uh, we called Cisco Tech immediately, and we also called Apple, and they came and took a look at it for us, and, and agreed that you know there was some issue, and that uh, you know with bringing all the people in together, it helped because we were able to find a resolution. And having that uh, trace file that shows exactly what happened would would be is you know critical to be able to pull that off. Um, Another thing, what if you had if you had a Mac actually that you could test on before? That would have been a little helpful as well. Hey, here's an excuse for you to have to go uh, get a MacBook, right? I, I'm going to ask Santa for one. There you go. Uh, nice little spare thing to have around. Uh, if if you did see a DHCP requests coming off of the Mac, then that means that you were already associated and you had done the roaming. It was something past association that it, that had triggered that. So. Weird thing to track down. I'm glad you found the solution. And just to reiterate one more time, the solution for this was? Fast SSID change. Single check in your controller? Uh, yeah, single check. Single check. We like those when, they're, when you finally find them and that they're easy to do. Well, Tim, how would uh, someone get a hold of you if they wanted to ask you questions or follow up at all? Uh, email is the best way. tdenehy at ku edu. And we will add that uh, in the show notes so people could track you down. Thanks again for your time today, and I, I, I wish you and the Jayhawks luck in the coming game. Thanks. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. Well, I'd like to thank our participants here today. Uh, Jared from Synergy, a wireless value-added reseller. We heard a little bit about his company and the life that he leads as a wireless line professional. And the second one, I'd like to thank Tim for telling us about their troubleshooting experience with their network at the press box of the KU Jayhawks. I'm glad that they were able to get the, a 
usable and workable solution quite simply with just a couple of uh, words typed into their consoles. So thanks to both Jared and Tim. If you have any ideas of other topics you'd like to see or questions, feel free to email feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. Thanks for your time, and we'll see you again next week. Wireless LAN Weekly, a podcast focused on the needs of wireless LAN professionals. We look forward to your feedback. Please leave your comments at the bottom of the show notes or email feedback on the show can be sent to feedback at wirelesslandprofessionals.com. If you'd like to leave a voicemail feedback, just call 24-7 and leave a message at 1-801-481-9018. Until next time, this has been another production of wirelesslandprofessionals.com, a place to educate, inform, entertain, and inspire.